Hey guys, this is Ron. So this is the fifth video in our series on rediscovering the C programming language. In some of the previous videos, we talked about uh, setting up our environment, installing various programs um, that we'll be using along the way. We talked about uh, how to lay out our program with our main function, um, potentially bringing in header files for additional functionality, how to take some of our custom functions and put them in their own header files. And then we you know, talked about, well now, how do we compile our programs? We talked about compiling them with GCC. We talked about using make files. We talked about using some warning flags uh, in order to uh, ensure that we're you know, doing the, the proper things in order to uh, make our code hopefully, you know, not contain errors, right? And then we moved into talking about some of the basic data types uh, and how they may or may not uh, be of a certain size. And, and that is always dependent upon uh, the operating system we're running or uh, whether we have a 64-bit or a 32-bit processor. Um, and then we even talked in the last video about how to use the printf function uh, and get information about it to figure out, okay, what does that format string need to look like? So we've done a lot to talk you know, about various aspects of the C programming language, but we really haven't got down into actually using the C programming language. So this will be one of our first videos and where we actually uh, start to put a few things together. So what you see in front of you is a, a chart there on the right that I made uh, a while back just to kind of bring in some of the common uh, operators that you'll see. And most of these operators you'll see in other languages. More than likely because, well, these were common uh, operators that people decided on or the language itself is a derivative of C. And so it, it tended to use the same operators because that's what people were used to. So if you see here, you know, like I said, they're very common operators. We use the asterisk uh, to specify uh, multiplication. So A times B. We have the division operator, addition operator, subtraction operator. So very common. But what we'll see, at least with the division operator, is there's some things that we have to keep in the back of our mind when we're using it to ensure that we get the answer that we're actually looking for. As we move down, you may start to see uh, some operators you're less familiar with if you haven't been programming for very long. One of those being this percent uh, operator, which is the modulus. So we're going to get the remainder of something. So it's going to perform division, but the answer it's going to spit out to us is what would be the remainder after division took place. Then we have our increment and decrement. Um, and as we'll see, uh, this can come as a pre-increment or a post-increment. And what we'll see is we can get different answers on some of our, um, some of our uh, equations if we choose one over the other, right? Now, in my opinion, uh, do what makes sense to make your program readable, right? Um, if you need to increment something and you don't want to do it on its own line, that's cool and all, but make sure however you do it, whether you're doing it with one of these increment operators, you're doing it in a way that is obvious to somebody reading your code, right? And what we'll see is if you're not thinking about that, um, when you do some of these things, some of the answers could be less obvious. We have some bitwise operators and we'll kind of work through some of those uh, I have a, a link here that we can follow that talks a little bit about the bitwise operator. So if you're not used to um, using, uh, you know, or thinking about numbers in their binary form, then some of these could be, you know, a little odd to you. We have some shift operators, again, that kind of works at that uh, bit level. And then we have some uh, or some comparison operators, right? So this is an assignment operator. The ones below it here, these are all comparison operators. We're looking to see if one number is less than another number or greater than another number or less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. We can also use negation. Uh, and you'll typically see this when you're thinking more in the context of maybe a Boolean operation, whereas you're thinking true or false, 
you might want to use a negation operator if you want the opposite logic. So instead of looking for a false, you know, you, you're actually looking to get a true out of that. All right. And then we have our ampersand, ampersand, which is logical and we have logical or, and so these are oftentimes used in comparisons, but to, to string multiple comparisons together. All right. And we can kind of work through some of that. Um, and then down here, we have an ampersand and a star. And you're probably thinking to yourself again, if you haven't uh, done C before, hey, wait a second, didn't we already use the ampersand and the asterisk? Well, we did, we used this for the bitwise and, and we used it uh, for multiplication. So what gives? Well, when used with a single variable like this, what they actually do is this one gives the address of this variable. Whereas this one uh, performs an indirection on A. And that probably won't make sense to you until we get to talking about pointers. Where pointers are actual, uh, instead of holding a value themselves, they hold a memory address. And so they point to some point in memory and it's at that point in memory where the actual value is stored. And so by using this indirection operator, we can actually pull the value out that A is pointing to, right? And so again, that might not make a whole lot of sense now, uh, but in the context of pointers, we'll see this quite a bit. We have the subscript operator. So this is the brackets here. And so as we start working with arrays, as we start working with strings, which are really just character arrays, um, you know, the subscript operator allows us to pull a single element out of that array. Again, we're going to go over pieces like this, um, but just wanted to show you that these uh, operators do exist. As we start talking about structs, what we'll find is a struct is a way for us to kind of build our own data type composed of other data types, right? So um, it's like a container that I could have uh, a couple of integers in there, maybe a float, a string, a pointer to another element, you know, just all sorts of different things you can include in your struct. And as you um, use that struct and pass it around, um, the struct itself, in order to access an individual uh, member of that struct, you use the dot operator. So in this case, A is the struct and B is the member inside that struct uh, that we want to be able to reference. Well, just like we talked about here where we had pointers, where this variable A doesn't hold a value, it holds a memory address of a value. So it's basically pointing to some point in memory where that address or where that value uh, lies. We can do the same thing with a struct where in this case, A is a pointer to a struct. So A contains a memory address and that memory address points to some point in memory where that struct is actually written. And so in this case, you, you basically have to perform not only an indirection, but then uh, access the individual member. Well, in C, they allow us to do that all at one time using this arrow operator. So it not only performs indirection, uh, you know, basically takes that memory address, goes to that memory address, but then grabs the value, uh, the member B, right? And so the arrow operator allows us to perform both of those at the same time. Now, in our previous video, especially in the video on our basic data types, we saw the size of operator. And this is like a macro that will tell us, okay, given A, how many bytes uh, does A require in order to store its value, right? And that's dependent upon the type of um, the type of variable it is. Is it an integer? Is it a float? Is it a pointer to something? You know, right? So again, size of operator we've seen uh, and we'll continue to see it as we go forward. And this last one you'll, you'll see in a few occasions. This is a conditional evaluation. Uh, you'll often hear or see it referred to as a ternary operator. So basically it looks at this first variable A. If A is true, 
it will return this B value. If A is false, it will return this C value. And so where you may see this is, uh, I often use them in like a print statement um, where instead of having an if statement and having two different print statements inside that if statement, you know, do this print statement if it's true, but do that print statement if it's false. Instead of doing that, I can have a single print statement and then inside of it, I do this ternary operation where it evaluates something and then returns B up to be printed or returns C up to be printed, right? And so we may or may not see that, but keep in your mind, oftentimes referred to as a ternary operator. Okay, so let's check out uh, multiplication is pretty simple. That's fairly straightforward. Addition and subtraction, fairly straightforward. Let's look at division, because oftentimes uh, if you're brand new uh, to a language like C, uh, division can kind of throw you for a loop because you're not expecting uh, certain things to happen. So if we do vi division.c, we'll go ahead and pound include stdio.h so that we can print. We'll do an int main. We're not going to pass in any arguments to main. And then we'll build two variables, right? So we'll have int a equals 5 and int b uh, equals um, 3. Uh, let's go 3, right? Okay, so what we should expect is 5 divided by 3, in our mind, that should come out as some uh, decimal value. Well, if I just did something like a divided by b, because a is an integer and b is an integer, c is gonna go ahead and assume the result is also an integer. And so we could have int c equals a divided by b. And then print f percent d uh, divided by percent d um, equals percent d slash n, because we want a carriage return. This will be a, b, c, return zero. All right, so we're gonna perform this division and we're going to store it back in C and C, you know, then we're going to print out all of these results, right? So if I do a make division and then I run division, I get five divided by three is one, right? And this is because three goes into five one time, right? But because this was an integer and this was an integer, we stored it in an integer and so we lose the actual uh, decimal portion of it, right? But instead, what we probably really wanted was something like a float here. So we have float C, we'll make this an F, we'll resave that and quit. We'll remake our division and we run it again. But again, we have the wrong answer, right? It just, again, assumed, wait, you said integer, you said integer, so I did integer division and stored that inside of a float. Well, a float needs to have some decimal points after it, so it just made those zero, right? It did not do any kind of uh, float division here, it just did integer division. And so, again, our result is just 1.0, right? Which is obviously wrong. So instead, when we have these cases, we need to make sure that at least one of these elements is a float, so it knows that the result should also be a float. So we're just gonna cast this one as a float. Okay, we'll go ahead and save and quit. We'll go ahead and recompile, or er, recompile, and we'll run it again. And this time, we get an answer that's a little bit closer, right? So in this case, there's a bit of rounding going on, so it rounded up, but essentially, this was our answer. And this makes a whole lot more sense than this does, right? So we just need to pay attention that when we're doing division, if we expect it to do uh, a floating point number, you know, the, the result will have a decimal point, 
then we need to at least make sure one of these is a, a floating point number. And we can do that by just casting it as a float. Okay, so that one was pretty easy. Let's go back to our chart. It's just something we have to think about. Now we have modulus. Again, if you're not used to the modulus, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, put a modulus inside our division. And so we'll come down here and we'll say uh, C, well, we need an integer for this. We'll do an integer D, why not? I'm using very great, uh, you know, variable names. You should never do this, right? But anyway, so D could be equal to uh, A modulus B. And so if I do a printf, we'll say this is percent D mod percent D equals percent D slash N. So this should be A, B, D. We'll go ahead and write that and quit. We'll go ahead and recompile and run it. And this makes sense, right? So three only goes into five one time. So the result or what's left over is two, right? And so our mod is two, right? So again, we can do our normal division but if we, all we cared about was uh, what remained, then mod is, is, is our tool to do that. Where you most often see this, um, well, I can't say most often, but likely you'll use this early on in just trying to tell if something is maybe even or odd. Um, so you'll do a mod two. Um, and so if you get back at least one, you know that it was odd. If you get back a zero, it evenly divided, and you know the, the number was even, right? But it goes beyond that. There's a lot of different um, things that you can do with mod, um, and so you'll see it quite a bit in other people's code, right? So let's see here. What do we got next that we want to look at? Let's look at our increment and decrement only because I've seen... Um, I've seen that screw some people up because they weren't thinking about uh, pre and post uh, increment or decrement. So we'll do uh, pre post dot C pound include stdio dot H again in main. And this time in A will equal uh, 10 in B. Uh, we can make this, I don't know, seven. And then we'll have int C, which will hold our uh, result. So if we did um, A plus B, but then we're going to post increment. So let's do C equals um, A plus B. And we're going to do a post increment there. We can now print F and see what our value C should equal. Well, let's go ahead and we'll do all of them. So A is currently equal to uh, percent D, B, percent D, and C, percent D, carriage return A, B, C. Return zero, we'll close out, all right? So what we should expect to see is A started out as 10, and nothing is changing A in here. So we should have A is 10. B started out as seven, but we did a post increment here. So what we should see is B is now equal to eight. And then C should be equal to what these originated were, originally were when they're added together. So 10, seven, we should see 17 in C, right? So this happens after this takes place. So first A is added to B, that assignment takes place, and then B is incremented. All right. All right, and that is in fact what we see. So originally B was seven. So when it was added to 10, it resulted in 17. 
And then once this operation was done, B was incremented, right? So this is a, a post uh, increment, right? So let's go back and let's try this again. C equals uh, A plus uh, minus minus B. And we can yank this, paste it down there. All right, so what should we see? So C is going to still be equal to A plus B. Or let's do it this way. Let's not do it as a decrement or else this is going to look very similar. So in this case, coming out of here, we already know that A is equal to 10. B got incremented to 7. And so what we should see here is A is 7. Or correction, A is 10 and B is 7. Or B is 8, sorry. It got incremented here, so it's now 8. But in this case, we're going to perform the increment prior to doing this operation, right? And so what we should see, hopefully, is 10 plus 9. Well, so this will be 19, right? So let's give that a try. And in fact, that is what we get, right? So going into this operation, we had 10 here. You know, A never changed. B was 8, but we performed a pre-increment. So it now bumped to 9. So when the addition takes place, we get 19. So in this case, we had a pre or a post-increment. And in this case, we had a pre-increment, right? And so sometimes you have to pay attention to those kinds of things. Uh, if you're doing uh, increment or decrement in line with uh, some other type of operation, you just got to think in your mind, okay, when is this going to happen, right? Is this going to increment it before this operation or after it, right? So not too difficult. Just wanted to kind of point that out. Uh, decrement works the exact same way, right? That you either do it pre or you do it post. Now, bitwise and or XOR and not. So let's check out this article. And they talk about the, the same kind of things, you know, using the and or uh, XOR and one's complement, uh, which uh, I think I just call that the not, right? So if we look in the first case, uh, they're saying A is equal to 60, um, B equals 13, and then they're doing these operations. But below, they're at least nice enough to show the binary for everything. So this is the binary equivalent for 60, right? And this is the binary equivalent for 13. And so what we see when we do A and B, in an AND operation, both A and B have to be one in order for the result to be one. So in this case, we have zero and zero equals zero. Zero and zero equals zero. One and zero equals zero because both of them have to be one. Same thing, one and zero equals zero. But now we finally have one and one is equal to one. One and one is equal to one. But then zero and zero, zero and one. And so we just have zeros afterwards, right? So that one kind of makes sense. In or, if either one of these are a one, the result is a one. And so what we see is zero and zero is still zero. Zero and zero is still zero. One or zero is equal to one. One or zero is equal to one. Then one and one is equal to one because at least one of them is a one, right? And so on and so forth, right? So in the and operation, uh, our number could stay the same or go down. In this case, it went down a little bit. Uh, in an and oper or in an or operation, we typically either stay the same or it goes up in value. 
So that's typically what we see. And in this case, it did go up at least one. But again, in an AND, both of them have to be a one in order to get a one out. In an OR, if either one of them are a one, you're going to, you're going to get a one. XOR is a little bit different. XOR, they have to be different in order to get a one out. So zero, X or zero, well, they're the same, so I get a zero. Zero, X or zero, well, they're the same, so I get a zero. One, X or zero, well, they're finally different, so I get a one. One, X or zero, they're different, so I get a one. One, X or one, well, they're the same, so I get a zero, and so on down the line. Now this may seem a little bit odd to do, but the beauty of the XOR is that in operations like uh, encryption or uh, some type of encoding, you know, whatever, typically encryption, um, if A was the value I was trying to encrypt and B was my key value, by doing A, X, or B, I get a new encrypted value. But then I can take this encrypted value and XOR it with the same key, and what I will get back is my original A. Because it's, it's kind of like flip-flopping some of these bits depending upon the key, right? And so if you keep XORing it with the same key, it just flip-flops between its original value and its encrypted value, and then back to its original value, and then back to the encrypted value. Just keep XORing it with B, right? And so again, if B is my key, then it's easy for me to just A, XOR with my key, I get my encrypted value. I pass this value uh, to my friend, and I tell him what the key is, he XORs it with the key, and he gets my original message, right? And so, XOR is used in that capacity quite a bit. Uh, we have, uh, they call it the inverse, uh, what do they call it? Binary ones complement operator or the not operator. Uh, all it's doing is flipping bits. So in this case, we have A. And so what they're doing is just flipping the bit. So instead of having 0, 0, 1, 1, we now have 1, 1, 0, 0, which is what we get, right? So pretty easy when you just think about it, it flips the bits, right? Now, here we have a shift operation. So we have a left shift by two. This means that we're gonna take A and we're gonna shift all of the bits left by two spots. And so now the new, uh, there should be two new bits uh, on the side here. We just put zeros in their place. So in this case, they're only showing uh, a whole byte right here, meaning eight bits. And so what you see is one, 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 one now ends up being at the top because everything shifted left by four. And you get one, 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 and then zero, zero from the original number. And then zero, zero here is the two new bits that basically got picked up because we shifted left by two. Now, right shift looks nearly identical, right? So where we had one, 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 one here, we shift right to these now, these two bits get thrown away. And so the one, 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 one is now here to the right. And we have two new bits that show up up top in order for us to have our total of eight bits, right? So this might not quite be obvious what it's doing, but when you start looking at um, our, our binary that's in the actual background, this is actually two to the zero power. This is two to the first power. This is two to the second power. This is two to the eighth power, or sorry, two to the third powers, and you know, so on as we go. 
So by doing shift operations, when we shift left, we're actually multiplying by two every time we perform a shift. So let's see, we had 60. If we multiply it by two, we get 120. And then because we did another shift, we now take 120, double that, and we end up with 240, right? So we can perform now uh, powers of two multiplication um, with our left shift. And equally with our right shift, we're now uh, dividing by two. So if we take our 60, we divide that by two, we get 30. And then because we're shifting by two, we divide that again. So now we have 30 divided by two and we end up with 15. The reason that this is powerful is because um, you may be performing this type of operation in your program and instead of doing an actual division, it's much more efficient to do a left shift or right shift. And so you may see that in various algorithms uh, that you come across. Okay, so those are our, um, our uh, kind of our binary ands, ors, xors, you know, so on and so forth. Let's see, what else do we have here that we'd like to talk about? So we can do equality checks, and while I'm doing some equality checks, we'll go ahead and, and throw in some of these logical ands and logical ors. The rest of these down here, we're gonna leave those for another day, right? Because um, they're gonna make a whole lot more sense when we start to work with arrays, when we start to work with pointers and structs. Uh, and so we'll leave those for another day. But what we can do is some of these equality operations um, and then tie those together with some logical ands and logical ors, right? So let's do that. So let's call this, uh, we'll just call it comparison. I don't remember if comparison has two R's or one. Parison, does that look right? I don't know. We're gonna go with one R, Parison. I'm probably wrong and somebody who's a much better speller than me is gonna call me out on. So, we're gonna pound include stdio.h and just because we're gonna go ahead and pound include standard bool dot h because it'll make some of our uh, and operations a little bit clearer so we'll do int main we're not going to pass anything into our main function and we're good so we'll do an int a equals uh, 10 and we'll do an int b equals 5 right so um, let's do uh, print f percent d slash n We'll do a is less or a is equal to b. And what is the answer to that? We'll call a equal b. All right, so this is our first comparison um, that we're coming across. Return zero, and we'll close it out. We'll write and quit, make comparison. And let's see, what is it called? Oh, I misspelled bool. Apparently, I forgot my L. So we'll write and quit that. Arrow up to make comparison. And in fact, A equals, or uh, in the comparison of whether A is equal to B, we get a zero, right? Because they're not equal. If I go back and instead of comparing here I compare to myself, I should see that in fact I am equal with myself, right? Oops, I don't wanna do that. I wanna run my binary and yes, A uh, is in fact equal to A, right? That makes a whole lot of sense. Um, what we can do is also perform uh, A is equal to A and b is equal to b. Obviously this should be true because this is b is equal to b. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna perform this operation 
And if this results in uh, a true or a one, then it's also gonna perform this operation. Because C likes to shortcut things. So it knows in an and operation, both sides have to be true in order for the whole thing to be true. So if this first thing that ev it evaluates isn't true, there's no point in evaluating the second one. And oftentimes we'll see this. Um, I do this all the time with pointers, right? So one of the, remember we talked about pointers where a pointer really just holds a memory address and that memory address is where the actual value lies. So it points to some point in memory where the value resides. Well, when you first create a pointer, you don't have to actually put an, a memory address in there yet. But if you try to reach into it to grab that value, it will blow up. Your program will have a segmentation fault and it will die. Um, and so oftentimes before you use a pointer for the first time, you wanna validate that there's something there. There's an actual memory address there that you can use. And so you'll test it against uh, what we call null. Um, and so you would see something like, um, we'll call this uh, an integer pointer. So in uh, P, and the first time we create it, we might make it null, right? And so one of the checks that you'll do um, is P equal to null. Because if I don't make this check and I do an indirection on P, this will result in a segmentation fault, right? This will blow up in my face, right? Because I'm trying to reach into P to grab the value that it points to, but it doesn't actually point to anything because it, it holds a null value. It doesn't have an address yet. And so we'll oftentimes do things like that. So to get back to my point here is you may do this uh, comparison, this equality check to see if it's null. And if it's not null, then you'll perform something. So maybe um, you'll do something like not null uh, and star P is equal to, I don't know, 10, right? We don't want to perform this check if we haven't validated that P is not null, right? And so instead of doing like that, you'll probably actually see it as that, where it's not equal to null and star P is equal to 10. So we're saying P points to the value 10, right? But we don't want to perform this again until we first validated that P itself doesn't currently point to null. Otherwise, this is gonna blow up and we're gonna have a segmentation fault, right? So let's get rid of this. I know that was a little bit of dive into pointers, um, but the whole point, well, that's kind of funny, but anyway, the whole purpose was we're using the ampersand operator, dual ampersand operator to do an and. It's gonna first evaluate this first one. And if it doesn't evaluate to true or one, you know, a non-zero value, um, then it's gonna go ahead and do this second one. And it might even be for a positive value, right? So zero or below is considered negative. I'd ha I'll have to check that one. Um, but essentially, this should be true, and then this should be true. And so our result should be a one here. So let's give that a try. And in fact, it is, right? So A is equal to A and B is equal to B, right? But we can also do other types of checks. Instead of just doing this straight equality check, we can do is A less than B. We can recompile, rerun it. A is not less than B, right? 
And we could do all of our other checks. We could see if it's greater than, greater than or equal to, all those sorts of different things. Um, and we could do some weird stuff with um, some of our Boolean values. So this could be true or false. True or false. Recompile, rerun. True or false is true because in an or operation, as long as either one of them is true, we get a true back, right? And then if we really wanted to get crazy, why not? Um, we could do something like Instead of being that, we'll make it a string, true or false. And we remember seeing our ternary. I think this is false. So what we should see is it's first gonna perform this evaluation, is true or false, right? And based on that, whether that ends up resulting in a true, if it results in true, I'm gonna return the string true Otherwise, I'm going to return the string false. And so we use percent %s in order to capture a string. Make comparison. Oop. Make comparison. Dot slash comparison. And we do, in fact, get our string true. Right? So that makes sense. Right? So hopefully uh, that helps with some of the uh, operators that you may see as you're working through. We definitely talked a little bit about uh, how division can get a little bit funky if you're not taking into consideration uh, one side has to be afloat. Otherwise, it's going to perform integer division, which may or may not be what you want. We talked about modulus comes in handy to get the remainder. Um, a lot of times you uh, may see this run in like a range type operation where we're going to say uh, we never want the value to exceed 10, right? It's just going to keep incrementing from 0 to 9, 0 to 9, 0 to 9. Um, at the end of every loop, what we can do is a mod 10 and put that number back into uh, whichever, you know, number we were using, right? So if I kind of do a vi range.c, uh, we can do pound include stdio.h, stdio.h. And we'll do int main. And we'll call this int i. Uh, and we'll start it at the value zero. Why not? And just for some craziness, we'll have an int b equal to zero as well. Just so that we have something. I'm gonna create what's called an infinite loop. Uh, so I know we haven't talked about looping yet, but we'll just do while one. So this is the same as saying while true. Um, it's gonna evaluate whatever's in here, and if it comes out to a value of true, it's going to loop. So since there's only a value of one there, it's gonna loop forever, right? And so what we can do um, is uh, print f, and we'll do a percent d slash n, and we'll say uh, this is going to be b, and here I'm going to go ahead and increment. Now this is our post increment, so it's first going to value. Oh, let's do it as i. Um, it's going to do this after it evaluates it. So we should see zero as our starting value. But then after it does this, it's going to increment it uh, and it goes. We'll do a B plus plus as well. And then if uh, B is equal to, um, we'll call this 20. Why not? We're going to break. So this is a, a way for me to get out of my while loop. And then at some point here, I'm just gonna do B, and here's something different that we haven't talked about. Percent equals, and we'll call this 10. 
So this is percent equals is the same as putting B equals B percent 10, right? So we're gonna do this evaluation. So we're gonna perform this modulus operation and take the result and store it back in B. Well, you can shortcut that and so you don't have to type as much by just doing uh, percent equals or mod equals 10. So again, it's the same as B equals B percent 10 or B mod 10. All right, so the whole point of here is that what we should see, well, I don't wanna do this, B, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. I wanna do it with I. So what I want to see is that we're gonna print out zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then once B is finally, or I has finally been incremented to 10, and we get to here, it performs a mod 10. So the result is gonna go back in here and I will now start over at zero again. And we're only using B here to so that we don't you know go forever. We could make this um, we make this 25 so it goes a little bit longer. But what we should see is uh, I will go from zero to nine, then start back over. Zero to nine, start back over. And then once B finally gets to the point of being 25, we're gonna break out of the loop, return zero, and close out. All right, so the whole point of this is one, you get to see the modulus operator again. This time you get to see it in an assignment like this where it can kind of shortcut. And so this is a cool way to make sure that your number always stays within a given range. So we wanna say, I wanna go from zero to nine, but I never wanna go above nine. So I'll always stay within that range. So assuming I've typed everything correctly, we'll right quit, we'll make range, dot slash range. And if I slide up, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we start it over. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we start it over. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is about the point, or you know, this is the point where B got to 25 and it broke us out of our loop, right? So, a little odd, but you can see how you know the modulus operator can help us affect a range, right? And so you'll see it used quite a bit in that respect, so that you maybe don't go out of the bounds of an array that you have built. You know your array has 10 elements in it and it's indexed from element zero all the way up to element nine. And you wanna make sure that the index values that you generate never go above nine or you're gonna be reaching outside of your array. And that's one of the problems with the C programming language is it's gonna let you do that. And then bad things can happen. So you wanna make sure that you have some kind of control that you always stay within that range even though you're looping across it. And so modulus sometimes is super useful uh, for doing those kinds of things. Okay, so I think this video has gone way too long. Uh, and if you survived this long, congratulations. Uh, I, it's impressive, uh, but I hope in some way, shape or form, this was useful to you uh, as you explored the C programming language. Thank you. Bye.